Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our online talk with artist Robin Holder. I'm Sarah Kirk Hanley, Executive Director of Manhattan Graphic Center. Our events are made possible by grants from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, New York State Council on the Arts, the Pierre and Tana Matisse Foundation, and other foundations and individual supporters. Thank you. MGC's Artist Talks under COVID are made possible with funds from the Niska Electronic Media slash Film Partnership with Wave Farm Media Arts Assistance Fund with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. Our guest this evening is Robin Holder, whose motto is, let's raise our racial IQ art that explores diversity. We are delighted for this timely discussion as our nation debates racial equity. Holder has been developing her complex social justice imagery for over 20 years. She applies an innovative mixed technique approach to various media. Her visual narratives inspired by a biracial multi-ethnic background encourage vital community dialogues about agonizing conflicts of identity, fostering awareness and appreciation for our diverse society. Holder was first introduced to printmaking as a high school student at LaGuardia High School for the Arts in New York City. After working in lithography in Amsterdam, Holland, she became the assistant director of Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop in New York City in the 1980s. She was also the first Manhattan Graphic Center minority resident artist at the same, around the same time. Robin is currently a 2020 Clark Hewlings Fund Executive Fellow. Holder has presented solo exhibitions in several major museums, including Mobile Museum of Art, the Spelman College Museum, the David Driscoll Center, the American Labor Museum, and the North Carolina Central University Art Museum. She has also completed site-specific public art commissions in New York City for public schools and an MTA subway stop. Holder has received numerous residencies, grants, and awards, including an individual visual artist grant from the Brooklyn Arts Council and a Mid-Atlantic Mid Arts Foundation Artist Catalyst Grant. She has been filmed by the Artist Archive, the New York Foundation for the Arts, La Pointe, and the Women Gather, WBAI Pacifica, and AMC TV. Her work is included in significant collections, including the Library of Congress, Con Edison, Xerox Corporation, Yale University, United Parcel Service, the Washington State Art Commission, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. We're very delighted to have such an accomplished artist with us tonight, but before we begin, I would like to um, share some notes about this evening's event. So we have disabled the chat function for this webinar so you can allow, so you can allow, have full enjoyment of the images on your screen. Please type any questions you have for Robin Holder in the Q&A function, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. I will be monitoring these questions and if they pertain to the work she's discussing at hand, I will um, interject and we can discuss that question. But if it's a more philosophical uh, question, we'll save it for the discussion after her presentation. Uh, and now please welcome Robin Holder. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I'm pleased to welcome you here to my studio. Before I start my um, PowerPoint presentation, I just want you to get a sense of the size of these works that are behind me. I'm in my studio now, and I'll be talking about several different series of works. The works that I'm going to share with you are all uh, pieces that I've created since the 
late 1990s. Uh, I wanted to really focus on societal issues of inequity, identity, racism, and classism. And I also wanted to start incorporating text into my imagery. So the next few images were created on Arsh Cover Black. Um, I used a combination of painting with lithographic inks, Hanshi litho inks, mixed with Windsor oil paints on plexiglass and surface rolling stencils that I cut out of acetate. It was a thin acetate actually that is used for theater scrims. So it's easy to cut with a knife, with a pair of scissors and to ink and resisted all of the solvents that I was using at the time, which was lithotine. So the reason that I approached this particular series with these techniques had to do with the fact that I wanted to demonstrate or express my awakening of my identity growing up as an adolescent and a teenager in um, New York City on the Upper West Side. And I wanted to um, show that my life or my thinking as many people's is, is compartmentalized. And so this is um, speaking to the fact that many children of color, many immigrant children, many children of marginalized families and communities grow up with an understanding that there is an aspect of violence um, or discrimination that is in action, in effective during and while they are living. So here we're seeing playing and it's in color. So this is sort of highlighting the activity of the moment, my life as a, as a youngster. And then these side panels are in black and white. This is another one um, that has to do with at all of my social activity pretty much in high school had to do with demonstrating. I grew up in the mid and late 1960s. So this is joining demonstrations and here you see the good guys and here you see the bad guys. This is done with again painting on plexiglass, printing on arch cover black, and then using some plastic stencils that were surface rolled on top. In addition, on top of here, there are some um, Karan Dash markings directly on the paper. Here again, the compartmentalization of thinking or awareness or understanding as a child. Um, I come from a biracial background um, and this is speaking to the Jewish aspect of my identity. And again, here these shapes, each shape is surface rolled and inked printed directly um, onto the paper and these are painted elements with again surface rolled inked stencils. This one has it, a lot Can of, I just ask a quick yes. question? Mm -hmm. um, is this the uh, What's Black and White series? Yeah, this these okay. are What's Black and White and Red All Over question mark an African-American, Russian, Jewish, red diaper baby. That was the series. It's a, a grouping of about 30 works. And here are iconic uh, images More of my- quick question, sorry. Yeah, when when was problem. that? <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> uh, when, when did you work on it? What, what are the These dates? are from the 1966, 1967. Okay. Yeah, um, 1968, yeah, 1966 to, I'm, I'm sorry, 1996 to okay. 1999. Okay, thank These you. Works, yeah, okay, not a problem. Sorry to so interrupt. This, is, <laughs> this again is speaking to um, um, 
I was always one of a very few brown-skinned children in class because I was in accelerated academic classes in um, actually PS 166 in Manhattan on 89th Street and junior high school 44 on 77th Street. But this feeling like you're one or the only one, one of a few or the only one really impacted me very strongly. And I still am often the only one or one of a few in some sort of gathering, either the only female or the only artist or the only African American or the only overweight person or the only person who has Jewish relations or the only person who uh, lives where I live. So this um, being singled out or feeling singled out is, has a lot to do with my formation. The next few works are from a group of pieces that I developed and there are about 20 of them that are um, a series called Outsourced. And I try to decide on a specific technique or series of techniques for each group of pieces that I explore because I want to, first of all, keep fresh and challenging myself. And because I want to have the techniques and the materials really resonate with the content of the imagery. This is about um, child slave labor. This is about outsourcing and the um, impact that outsourcing has on the loss of our middle class life in the United States and the dynamic conflict that it has um, really presented worldwide in terms of global economics. Um, this is a um, situation where everything that is a surface rolled stencil like this piece and the child's face, body and clothes is an acetate stencil that I surface rolled and inked on a piece of paper. I then laminated that paper um, with Goodio, dry, uh, dry adhesive, onto archival, uh, archival um, map board and then cut out areas. So all of the ovals are actually physically cut out. All of this is cut out. And this area that is blue and has these colored elements is an acrylic painting. So the under layer, the artwork is in two basic layers, well actually three because the printed part is laminated onto mat, mat board. So again, this is arch cover black, stencil rolled, um, stencil, um, surface rolled stencils inked and printed, mounted onto um, mat board and then cut out. And then underneath is the acrylic painting which expresses my life in relationship to a particular object. So this child slave in the image has some relationship to the manufacture or fabrication of an object that I am using. And this one is about cell phones because there is an element that um, is the conductor for high heat charges in cell phones that is called coltan. And that is mined in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo by young children whose lives are really lived as slaves. So here's another one. Um, I think I forgot to mention- I have another mention. couple of questions if I can yes. jump in. Um, one from Maggie Block. She's asking, um, how, how large are these? What are the dimensions? These are, um, what is the size of Arsh Cover Black? 44 by 32 or 42 by 30. Whatever the, the size of that paper is, I can't remember at the moment, that is the size of the work. Okay. Using the full um, sheet of paper. I think that's about right, if I recall. Um, yeah. haven't bought it in a while, but, um, and then uh, we have a question from Sandra Fernandez. Are these works one of a kind? I made two versions of each one because I wanted to be able to um, have a little more mobility in sharing them in different venues. 
So there are two versions. They're not exactly the same because there's hand, there's hand painted elements um, and the text is written slightly differently in each one, but they're basically two, two versions of each image. Here's another one, and this is relating to um, the um, uh, use of non-electrical um, tools by young children who work in different parts of the world uh, as really bonded labor. And many times they're paying off a family debt. The debt could be $60 US and they're bonded for five, six, eight years to pay off the family debt. And they don't have um, face masks. They don't have um, any kind of protective environmental um, foundations in the areas where they work. So all of these works relate to something specific in my life. And this has to do with my boyfriend, um, wanting a new drill. So I just said, oh yeah, I, I'll just buy him a new DeWalt, you know, that's no big deal. And then so that working um, in our studio with this tool is resonating with the fact that there are literally millions of children working with hand tools. These are um, some of the pieces that I made with a grant from the Brooklyn Arts Council. And this is based on um, Xerox lithography, which I had the pleasure of learning about uh, up at the Women's Studio Workshop at Rosendale. And I am using the image of building or um, window, doorway uh, for the first time with this series. And this is called Behind Each Window, A Voice. And I collected the life stories of eight very specific different neighbors of mine in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And I'm juxtaposing different um, aspects of their conflicts, uh, class, race, religion, um, nationality, coming to New York specifically from their countries of origin. So these are cut out areas, some have, um, partial cutouts that are flaps or open and close. And these are all elements from the testimonies that I collected from the people that I worked with. And then each one is a different building, actual building that I photographed. And at that time that I was doing that, I would have to go to the Xerox store and make friends with who I was in charge of the Xerox machine and try to print two or three times a black and white version of the image so that I would get a heavy layer of um, the ink on to the paper so that it could function as my, um, uh, my photographic litho, my uh, Xerox litho. So I, these are all 17 by 14 inches because that was the biggest paper you could get in those machines at the time. And I think this is actually the same building as this one, but I printed this one in a different color. And again, these are cut out and they're really demonstrating or expressing or responding to the different realities of, of different people living in a very small uh, physical neighborhood. Some knew each other, some didn't. Uh, these are, Recent pieces, these are from last year, and these are, if you look, you can see parts of uh, words or phrases here. And this is really sort of talking about, and this one is um, 50 inches by 30 inches. And this was done by combining uh, the photograph of a small stencil nature mono print that I made with the photograph of a prismacolor portrait that I made that was 12 by nine inches and digitally merging them and then printing them out as large format print.
prints and then drawing and you might be able to tell some of the drawing that on top of that large format print, you might be able to see the texture here of the drawing aspect. So this is really talking about um, every group of people pretty much has been victimized somewhere in some point of history in some area of the world. And it's to our advantage to learn the stories that um, people have to tell about their experiences um, and again, I'm using the whole concept of home, but in a different way. So this is kind of like a roof and I try to keep it open ended to indicate that there is an open future. Um, home, of course, sig signifying the roots of your understanding of your identity, the place where hopefully you feel safe. Um, you feel like you know who you're dealing with, you trust the people in your family, your fundamental idea of who you are in the world starts at home. Here's another one. With the same concept, the same issues, um, a different roof pattern, but again, these um, shapes here are from a very small, actually, the thing that really gives me a big tickle is the stencil monoprint that was a stencil monoprint of a tree that I made um, and photographed and used here is actually something like four by six inches. <laughs> and then the photo of uh, the um, portrait is 12 by nine inches, but by photographing them and then doing a lot of digital imaging on the computer, of course, using Adobe Photoshop, and then having it printed out large. This again is 50 inches by 30 inches, and then some handwork drawing and painting on top of it. It's this combination of um, approaches that allows me to work much bigger than I actually would be able to if I did any conventional printmaking. It also satisfies um, uh, my desire to do some painting, to do some drawing. I, I like drawing a lot because it's very intimate. It's very much a, a real organic extension of my hand. These I are a quick question about oh, that last. Oh, one. that okay. <laughs> Not um, a problem, Sarah. So uh, the question is, I think you answered it actually, but. Um, whether they're photos, the buildings are made of photos. I think you said they are and they're digitally manipulated, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I had a question. Um, I, I may have missed it, but what was the name of this series? You said you made it recently. Oh, yeah. The, these two pieces are from um, a series of works, actually, and a show that I presented at Kentler International Drawing Space this past uh, January and February uh, was called Access and Inequities. I hear you, do you see me? And this particular piece is uh, called, I believe, Catholics Not Welcome. And this one is Irish, No Irish Need Apply. And these are from signage from buildings, tenement buildings in um, New York City in, I'm not sure if it was the late 1800s or the early 1900s, but there were areas of the city where Irish were not welcome and the signs would say, you know, uh, for rentals to, don't apply here, you know, no niggers allowed, no Catholics are welcome. So these are actually, again, resonating with the um, reality of home, you know, living quarters, space, and um, they're all from real signs. These are um, wooden, wooden window shapes that have cutouts and they um, are about immigration and being afraid of life um, because you may be captured by ICE, because you're undocumented, because you may not feel that you have access to 
uh, certain civil liberties or certain civil rights you may not be able to articulate in the English language or psychologically and culturally you don't feel empowered enough to assert what you know are your rights or you have to not uh, or you have to hide part of your identity in order for a sense of well-being or in order to survive. So these are a combination of archival digital printing with drawing with Prismacolors and foil stamp printing um, using holographic and metallic foil. Well, these are not holographic, these are metallic foils. So it's all about that the, the, there's, there's something blocking. So the reason that I'm, I have these shapes here is that the lives and the uh, mobility and the sense of comfort and empowerment of many people is blocked because of being immigrants. So here's another set of three. And these are, um, I'm so un ignorant about numbers. Um, these are about maybe 20 inches high and they have three open areas and then the papers are, I used a variety of uh, rice papers for these actually. So they're printed, uh, actually these I think I printed, these I printed on my desktop inkjet printer and then drew on top of them. And then I ran them through the, the printer again to get the text on there. Oh, so it's like the size of, an office sheet, um, the image, the portrait. No, actually, you know, these, I'm looking now at one that's over on the other side of the studio. These are more like maybe 24 inches high, but they're in sections. So this is a small section. This is like, you know, less than a third of the height. And then this is less than a third. So they're, um, I'm looking, it looks like about 24 inches high. Now those, these, are, those are recent works as well? The, yeah, these are from uh, 2019. Okay. These are from 2019. And these are um, from the series that I kind of go back to periodically called um, USA, the United States of Anxiety. And I started this a while ago, and it has to do with this sense of uh, discomfort or unease or depression since um, probably around just before 2008 when the economy fell, when people were really realizing that they probably were not going to attain the American dream. And these are freeform pieces that are um, about, they range from 36 inches high to 46 inches high, and they're free form and they're laminated on archival foam core. And they are again, color pencil drawings and using the house image again for the same reasons that the whole um, sense of security, the whole sense of groundedness has been upended. So that's why each building is slightly off. It's like a little out of balance, leaning or twisted a little bit. And this is again, colored pencil with um, a combination of digitally imaging uh, parts of former prints that I made, uh, abstract prints with images, like here's a window that I manipulated had printed out as large format prints and then drew on, most of them I drew on top of them and some have some foil stamped elements on them. So this is, um, the title of this one is Equal Under the Law with a question mark and I think that's kind of self-explanatory um, considering the really large uh, societal acknowledgement of the murder of African-American and brown-skinned men. And this is um, called separation border crossing. So I think that's pretty evident what this is about. 
um, immigrants in Mexico crossing the border. So it's something that's kind of really, um, really jolting to me is this figure of this beautiful house with this horribly anxiety ridden face. Um, it was the face of a young girl. So I hope that it expresses youth too. And just to think that somebody that young would have that kind of uh, horrific anxiety is, is very, very, very troubling. So again, this kind of sense of being depressed or not quite sure how to proceed from here. Um, I think many or most uh, what we would consider middle-class Americans are finding that everything that was expected was to be able to have higher education, take care of your aging parents, give your children a good um, education, have affordable housing and transportation, and healthcare is kind of eroded by the, at this point. So this is really speaking to that reality that many of us are experiencing, um, that it's just almost um, impossible for millions and millions of Americans to really grasp how they can proceed on any level of prosperity at this point. So that's the end of the, of the PowerPoint. Well, I, I was holding back the tears there. It's very powerful work, uh, really intense. Uh, you, you deal with these complex societal issues so well. Um, we, I do have some questions for you um, to discuss. Um, we'll just start off with more general questions and get to the more um, physical, the meaty questions about uh, how your work addresses our societal uh, complexities of the moment. Um, so just um, one thing I noticed when I first started working with you is you prefer not to capitalize your name. And I just wanted to hear more about that decision. Oh, I, that, I made that a long time ago and I didn't really try to emphasize it for a couple of decades. But I, I remember um, at a certain point looking at my work and this probably was in the late 80s or early 90s and just feeling so small and so humble or so um, minute in the scheme of things. So I thought I, I wasn't going to capitalize my name and actually <laughs> kind of in a strange way resonates with something that had happened to me when I was around seven years old and I lived with my aunt, one of my father's sisters, um, and they were Caribbean, African Caribbeans, and I had to go to parochial school, and I was failing religion all the time. And I remember um, we had to go, we had to have religion instruction, religious instruction every day, and my parents did not raise me with any organized religion. And um, they kept saying that we had to spell God with a capital G. And I kept questioning that and asking, you know, like, well, I don't know who this father is that you keep telling me about this father. That's really not my father's name. And I don't know why I have to use a capital G. And they just kept saying, because he's grand, because God is he. Is he, he's grand, he's greater than us. And I kept saying, you know, well, I don't know, because could it be a lady? Why does God have to be a man? So I remembered that when I was you know, saying to myself, I mean, who am I to have a capital R and a capital H? I'll just, you know, have a small R and a small H. And I remembered, you know, thinking that I had as a very young child about the capital capitalization of the word G-O-D. That's, um, I remember that having that moment as a child also wondering. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, this is not about me, but I can relate is all I'm, I'm saying. Um, so I also, we noticed in your presentation that um, you use so many different techniques and layers and you're, to build up this rich imagery. Uh, 
Can you talk more about how you developed that unique approach as an artist, your development as, you know, a young artist, how this evolved? Yeah, um, well, I studied conventional etching for probably one semester in high school at Music and Art at LaGuardia School for the Arts. And I realized then that there was a lot of technical procedure that I would need to work through in order to get a result for of my image. And then I did some lithography in Amsterdam. And again, it was very process oriented. And I just kept feeling that as I was developing the images, well, this was stone lithography, as I was developing the images on the stone, my ideas kept changing or what I wanted to visually articulate kept changing. So it took me uh, about 10 or 15 years, but I finally realized what, what I needed to do was to just pick and choose um, the techniques that really resonated with me and combine them in a way that made sense to me. So if I wanted to have something that was um, kind of uh, painterly that I could actually paint and I could have that with stencils and the stencils that I have, I have thousands of them, thousands of them. And some of the images that I have created, uh, which we did not look at, have as many as 80 or 90 separate stencils, acetate stencils, that I inked and placed on a piece of inked plexiglass and ran through an etching press and then re-inked certain pieces and then placed them directly upside down on the print itself and re-inked. So, there's prints that I did more like a collage, like creating the image was almost like building a collage. And the stencils I could reuse from image to image. So within a certain series, there may be um, certain shapes that appear many, many times, but in different colors and in different contexts. So that made sense for the way that I wanted to work. And I um, remember that, I don't know um, if some of the people here today would know who Benny Andrews is. A, he's deceased now, but a wonderful African-American um, painter um, who was also the, in charge of special arts service, um, wasn't called special arts services, at the NEA, it was um, the equivalent of special arts services. Um, so he had that administrative position for a while, he, he told me that it, would, it was a good idea to work in series. That if you worked in a series, you could sort of give yourself a chance to concretize your concept, really work with a particular medium, and explore it in, with variations. So that's how it made sense for me to work the way that I do. And at the same time, I remember when I was um, very specifically at the printmaking workshop and meeting um, many of the wonderful artists that I, that became my mentors who were a generation or a generation and a half older than me, it, it would seem that some of them after 30, 40, 50 years of using the same medium, the same technique and the same concept, after a while, I wasn't seeing anything really extended or expanded in their visual articulation. So for me, it's also a way of kind of jumbling myself up and freaking myself out and giving myself a challenge to do something that I'm not quite sure is going to work. Um, I, I think that keeps a sense of um, humility in a way, because when I start a new series, I'm not really sure what's going to happen. And I'm really convinced that the creative process has to have a lot of unknowns in it. But then again, as a control freak, I have to have enough that I can depend on to, to work at the same time. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it also relates, I think, in a way to your complex uh, background and family history. And that's something I also would like to ask you. Uh, what uh, you say on your website that your heritage is African, Russian, Jewish, and Caribbean. 
and that you have a multiracial family and you share some experiences of how that has impacted your worldview. But I imagine, of course, it's a huge part of your artistic practice as well. And um, can you share more about how this, um, how it comes into play in your studio? Um, of course, we're all really very, very impacted by what we know ourselves to be, how we identify ourselves, our family, our, our national, racial, religious, class origin. But um, the, the more you explore, the more you realize there's something else regarding culture, identity that you connect with. And when you're, at least in my experience, being biracial and um, my first husband is Ecuadorian, so my son is, was born in Ecuador, he's bilingual, he has a culture that straddles everything that I straddle plus everything that his father's family straddles, which is, um, indigenous um, ancestry and um, Latinx and Hispanic ancestry. So um, when you are a multifaceted person in your identity, in a way you don't completely belong to any one specific group and your awareness and your experiences and your understanding and your lack of understanding are related to being some part of this and some part of that. And at the same time, every group of people has its real uh, discriminatory uh, embedded uh, psychology, whether they acknowledge it or not, whether they are even realize it or not. Um, and you hear things that some members of your family say that really demonstrate that they're really unaware of the reality of other aspects of your family identify with. It took me until probably almost just really 20 or 25 years ago to realize that one of the strongest aspects of identity that has impacted me and many of the people in my family is class. And I mean educational class, level of educational um, exposure, educational experience, educational achievement, and education as it relates to earning money. So our class status has a lot to do with more to, with, to our identity than we even have a glimpse of, particularly here in the Northeast and in New York City, where a lot of people think that they are just open-endedly humane and are, you know, uh, accepting of everyone. It's certainly not true in my experience. And I hear every day really vicious, classist comments by friends, neighbors, family members, colleagues. So um, when I'm talking about identity, I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about, you know, gender dynamics. I'm talking about um, any aspect of who you are in the reality that you're in in the moment, because many of us move from one reality to another. We function very much as parents or children or siblings or cousins or women, or men, or bisexual people, or African Americans, or Asians, or Native Americans. There's so many aspects to our identities that really determine very specifically how each one of us navigates the world and how we see the world. And I really am convinced that we need to share a lot more of that and ask those difficult questions because it's almost like, you know, we don't know what we don't know. We don't even know enough to know what we don't know. 
in a sense. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's quite apt. And I think many people are undergoing that sort of self-evaluation in, in response to events, recent events. Um, but, the, you know, there's so much more work to be done. Um, and I see, I see you're very eloquent on these. You've been dedicated a lifetime to thinking about and discussing and exposing and interrogating these issues in your work. And it's really lovely to hear your perspective. Um, we do have another question from the audience about your home-based imagery and whether it relates in any way to homelessness. Um, yes, it does. And actually, that, I'm so thankful for that question because I had a really um, very uh, powerful experience working in a homeless shelter for, I think it was three years, um, once a week. Uh, for maybe 12 weeks every year and learning about some of the dynamics. I was doing an arts and education program in a homeless shelter that was like just a block or two away from LaGuardia Airport. And just getting to know the children, it was a bizarre situation where I worked with children from ages five through 16. Was like, so we really had to manage it sort of like a family, extended family, rather than a particular gray group. Um, but we did a project um, about creating buildings using some of the uh, Western African building um, architecture as a resource and a reference. But we did it with a lot of colorful display board. And that experience really made me think a lot about what homelessness can or cannot mean, what it did and didn't. It's very complex and it's varied depending on the people and the family, but the the children that I was working with and getting to know some of their parents was very interesting. Um, learning what um, family dynamics they were able to keep in place being in a shelter. So the word homelessness didn't mean that they were in the street, living on the street, but they didn't have a permanent physical home. And I think the average stay of each family was probably six months in, in this particular shelter before they would move to another shelter or hopefully get a permanent um, affordable housing. So yes, uh, homelessness is something that I have had reason to think about um, and particularly because of living in Ecuador and Mexico, the way homelessness manifests is very different from here also. I can imagine um, things are different, of course, in a third world nation. Um, and here we have so much more work to do to support our homeless citizens. Um, which well, you we know, know what, Sarah, I just want to say one thing that most people don't really realize. Um, in, in, in many under-industrialized countries, a family member who's homeless goes to live with another part of the family. So they're not, you know, alone, abandoned, but they are not capable of maintaining their own home, their own physical home. So I'm not talking about people who are on the street, of course, and there are millions who live on the street, but on another level, and we're probably seeing this now with the pandemic and with the economic situation is that um, many people are returning home, whatever that means, to live with their families because they can't afford to live in an urban center where they were or on the university or wherever they were because they just can't afford it. So homelessness can mean many different things in many different uh, scenarios and realities. Yes, um, I 
And so how does that tie in with your choice of, of imagery? Because I've used uh, some reference to house structures or homes or windows or doorways in several different series. And I try to change the way that I'm using that reference to home. And of course, for me, the structure or the visual um, relationship to home really has to do with identity, self, family, tribe, community, neighborhood, nationality, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Uh, there's one last question. Um, if we don't have any more, if you have any questions for Robin, uh, please put them in the ch uh, Q&A function. But I have one last question for you. Um, in a recent interview on Artsy Shark, you discussed your first responders series in terms of a divide among economic classes and races in their experience of the pandemic, saying, stating, quote, highly educated and privileged citizens have a distinct advantage. These people can leave the city and have a better chance of surviving. They have the ability to remove themselves from risk while continuing to function professionally in a digital world. They have the resources to isolate and comfort. It makes for a very different dynamic than waking up with six people in a four room apartment. What kind of stress does this place on a family, end quote. Can you elaborate on how these thoughts informed your selection of Im imagery and layering in your uh, recent series, uh, we're, we're in it together? Um, I, in the images that I've created about the current pandemic, I haven't really visually articulated any kind of class difference so much as racial and ethnic difference, but behind the faces, and these two pieces behind me are from that series. So you can see that there are faces inside of bodies. So it's really about um, that we are connected and we have really to a large degree forgotten that. And I think it's, a, it's probably a, manifestation of one of the characteristics of Americans, number one, because Americans uh, pride, we pride ourselves on being independent and individualistic and um, making our own way, so to speak, and we are known worldwide for that in positive ways. But the negative aspect of that is being isolated and losing your sense of understanding of what your um, other people in your community are experiencing, your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues. Um, you, we really don't know what a lot of people are dealing with. And that was really the point of that series that I did with those Greenpoint Brooklyn houses with these, these windows is that every floor there's a family or two families and you don't have no idea of what, what they're going through, what they're dealing with, what their experience is. So just these layering of the faces on the bodies of people and the, the larger bodies in the series are all first responders. So on this side is a supermarket clerk and I really kind of did this um, thinking of a neighbor of mine near my studio who uh, works at Costco. And then this is a radiologist and um, just putting these faces on top of the bodies and having them be some sort of different color or feature so that you get an idea of this is a mixture, a diversity of layering of people. Um, really to just say we're all connected. We all have something to do with each other. Um, I think all of these issues are, have um, history to them. This is nothing new. It's just that it's more apparent now and people are more willing to look at it and discuss it and hopefully brainstorm solutions to it at this particular moment. 
And it doesn't mean that these are only problems um, here in the United States. These are problems worldwide. So we really have to think um, about how we can maintain our own sense of self and at the same time plan for the well-being of the group. Yes, I, um, I think it's been a very isolating, generally past few decades um, with social media and now especially the COVID pandemic, um, we've really lost our connection to each other and um, I think that your work really shows us, reminds us um, that we are all in it together and uh, we hope that these artist talks are helping to connect people. We do have one more question um, from Chris Short. He really enjoys your uh, book series, Our Social Skin, and wonders if you could speak about it a little bit. Um, oh, yeah, those are, um, oh, those are a series that I created um, <laughs> because I was waitlisted for a Smithsonian grant, <laughs> and I put so much work into submitting my proposal, I decided to go through with it anyway. I didn't get the, the grant, the residency, but um, I created um, a handmade book in an edition of five for each of the 10 federal holidays. And so each of the um, holidays is represented by um, a garment that relates to that holiday. So um, the garment, the, they, they are open and closed in many different ways, unusual ways, and they're um, visible on my website. Um, and I was trying to reveal and um, express conflicts having to do with each holiday. So, for example, Christmas is... Like I could bring them up on the screen on, from your website. I, I don't know if you want to do that. I, I don't think we have time to do that right now, but Christmas is in the shape of onesies, pajamas, like little kids wear the one the little flannel ones, pajamas, and the flaps say, <laughs> you know, how much money would Jesus spend on Christmas? <laughs> so it's kind of pointing out the commercialization of Christmas, which is supposed to be the most revered spiritual holiday. But each holiday um, uh, really has, I learned a lot of our history. I learned a lot about how some of these holidays became holidays. Um, and, but I, I think one of the most horrifically painful ones was Columbus Day. It was just the research that I did for that was just bone chilling, horrific, beyond, so horrible. What happens is that sometimes when I'm working that what I uncover in my research is so painful that I have to then just, you know, create some images with plants and flowers and animals for a while just to kind of not go overboard and become insane because the history of humans on earth and in the United States is really revolting. So um, yeah, our social skin. So I called it our social skin because the federal holidays I figure really sort of uh, are a manifestation of how a country thinks of itself. So that's what that was. Great. All right, one last question from the audience. Uh, what's next for you? You've obviously been, are you still continuing with the uh, are, We're All In It Together series with responding to COVID or are you moving on? To yeah, something? that's a, you know, I, I, I love and hate that question because on one hand, I how am I gonna know what's gonna happen? But I will say, to be honest, that um, last week I was working on another pandemic piece and I could feel the passion fading out. So I feel like it might be that I have done what I can do right now with that technique and that content and that approach, or I might start doing it in another way. 
But uh, at the moment, I'm still really thinking about the issues that the pandemic arises with first responders and being connected with each other. Okay. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, we have questions about your website, so I will share that information in just a minute. I just would like to thank you so much for your insightful and uh, very uh, timely comments today. I, I know that these issues have been existing for centuries, but we're all more open to uh, really thinking about it, I think. Um, these days and your work is really resonating. I'm sure I, I'm hearing I'm seeing the comments come in uh, and um, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience who joined us this evening um, You can learn more about Robin on her website and her work at robinholder.work and You could follow her on Instagram, which is at creative the number three intention or Facebook at Robin Holder Me. And uh, all of that is also on the original Artist Talk um, sign up page on our website. So you can go to our website and find this Artist Talk to, to look that up as well. We hope you will join us for our next Artist Talk on Wednesday, October 28th at 5 p.m. with Jennifer Mack Watkins. This will be the second talk in our series of speakers from Black Women of Print. And um, we will have uh, six in total. So uh, we hope you'll join us for those on a monthly basis through next March. To be informed about the details of our artist talks, please join MGC's mailing list on our website uh, or follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Manhattan Graphics Center. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Bye.